evening, everyone, and thank you for being here tonight, this evening. Um, we're here to listen to a discussion between Albi Sachs and Lara Tetrakian this evening, and the topic is Harnessing the Power of Soft Vengeance. Uh, this event has been made possible thanks to the Friedrich Human Foundation Armenia, and with support from the Crest Foundation, and as the Hanabdin Foundation, we'd like to thank you all for being with us this evening. I'll pass the floor to Lara. She'll briefly tell us a bit more about herself and Albi, and then I guess you have a few questions for him. Well, the only thing I want to say about myself is that I am so happy to be here. It's an honor to host this conversation. It's an honor to do anything with the Hurandik Foundation. I have a few very close friends in the audience, uh, and I really look forward to being in discussion with all of you tonight. The way we're going to run the course of the evening is I'll share a bit about uh, the background of our esteemed speaker, and then we'll be in conversation for a bit, a bit, quite a bit, before we open up the floor to your questions, and we'll just make it as conversational as possible. Alfie Sachs and his wonderful wife, Vanessa, told me specifically not to share any questions in advance. So he has no idea what we're talking about, except that it's really going to focus on uh, a concept that he's put forward in the world uh, that he calls soft vengeance. He's just spent his first full day in Yerevan. He paid a visit to the Genocide Museum, so I think he might already sense the way that his life's work and lessons layer on top of the Armenian experience for, for what we're going to be in discussion with tonight. I do want to say one, one other word. Uh, I had only one chance to meet Verati in Yerevan. We were panelists at the Armenian Diaspora Summit in the fall of 2006. Uh, and I'm, I'm amazed that he's now part of history because the writings and the voices that we hear in this exhibit tell us so much about what we need now. And they're a big part of what uh, I wish he were here to help us figure out. Uh, but maybe if we gaze upon more of his work, we'll be able to find our way. Justice Albi Sachs is a retired South African activist, lawyer, writer, and one of 11 judges appointed by Nelson Mandela to serve on the first constitutional court of South Africa post-apartheid. Now, are you really retired? Because you are traveling so much and doing so much. So I would challenge that part of the official life. But officially, he is retired. He was imprisoned to solitary confinement for his actions as a lawyer and his anti-apartheid activities. So his challenging and his standing up for human rights in the face of the apartheid government in South Africa earned him jail time, threats, physical attacks, uh, and vulnerabilities of all kinds. On April 7, 1988, he was the subject of an assassination attempt, a car bombing, but miraculously survived and recovered after a long year of rehabilitation in after this incident, he introduced the concept of soft vengeance, which upholds the notion that rather than perpetuate a cycle of violence, one should enable those who perpetrate violence to understand and acknowledge the harm that they've caused, thereby advancing reconstruction for the nation, for the community, for the victims, and even for the perpetrators. For Albi Sachs, soft vengeance was the establishment of the rule of law, equality, justice, freedom, and democracy in South Africa. So soft vengeance is somehow tied to making things right. Is that a fair sentence? We'll get there. We'll get there. It's, a, it's a little more, a little more complicated, more richer, yeah. and I think a, a more, more rewarding yes. than that. Everything's right, but there's more. We will, we will expand upon it. In 1990, Albi Sachs returned to South Africa following the release of Nelson Mandela from prison. He helped write the new constitution of South Africa and was then appointed as one of the first judges to the new constitutional court. He worked to consolidate human rights, he still works, to consolidate human rights in the country's justice system. He's received numerous awards for his work on human rights and justice, as well as for the books he's written. 
And in 2022, the Clooney Foundation for Justice started giving the Alby Awards, named in honor of Alby Sachs, to honor the efforts of people who work relentlessly to fight for human rights and justice by putting their lives at risk. He received awards, and then he became an award. That is quite a few. So thank you so much, Justice Alby Sachs, for being with us today. Tell us more. Can I just show off a little bit? Please. You say the Clooney Award. Uh, it's Amal yeah. and George Clooney. Yes. Can you imagine? I've only met him once. <laughs> and he was the one who actually designed the figure when they asked That's me would I, would I t allow my name to go forward to uh, uh, award people who have not only fought for justice, but fought against difficult odds for justice Absolutely. in different countries in the world. Oh, so I'm, I'm very deeply honored by that, but I'm thrilled I can't help showing off. George Clooney <laughs> and Amal Clooney. Yes. Uh, and, and we've met, I've met Amal twice and George once. So uh, I'm, I'm, in that sense, it, it's a counterpoint. You know, the, the session at the genocide monument was but to them, you're the exceptionally, celebrity. exceptionally heavy. I had yeah. to ask the people to allow me to lie down on the floor and cry a little bit afterwards. Uh, now I'm with yourselves, and I'm lifting up my spirits again. Uh, and and it, it's absolutely very wonderful for me to be participating. I, I, I've got to know Hrant Dink so well through attending activities of the institute. Uh, going to the, uh, the space in which he functioned, but through meeting the people, his family, but other people as well. Uh, and it's given me such a marvelous connection with Armenia. Uh, not picturesque Armenia, which is wonderful, not just ancient Armenia that's admirable, but present day Armenia. And, and with people with a certain sensibility uh, and an appreciation for, for culture uh, and for the richness of human existence. And I feel it, in, in that sense, uh, you know, just to anticipate the, the, the beauty of the soul of people now who are rebuilding the country, uh, who are singing, who are lining the streets with trees, who are creating beautiful monuments, that's all vengeance. It's soft vengeance because it's not only what it's telling the perpetrators, it's what you're doing to yourself. You're affirming, you're not allowing the viciousness of the past, you're not allowing them to make you inward and wounded and, and unable to express your own love and, and, and affection. So, so this is why uh, I accepted, and Vanessa and I accepted the invitation. We're madly busy. We're getting ready for the, uh, for the award at the end of September. Even silly things like going to the tailor to be measured for my Nelson Mandela shirt, I'm going to wear it. Vanessa going to the seamstress who's going to, on the way back, to try on the dress that she's going to wear. We want to show the Americans we've got style <laughs> in South Africa. I won't say that's part of salt vengeance, that's part of pride. Uh, but um, somehow I feel drawn to Armenia uh, and, and the pain of Armenia, but also that, that soft, sweet joy of Armenia and the solidarity you have amongst yourselves. Uh, for me, it's something very, very beautiful and, and very aligned to the theme that we Absolutely. can now get on to. I'm not retired, by the way. I hate that word. <laughs> I don't use that word because when you're retired, you're made to you put in a box. You're old, you have been, uh, and, and you're expected to behave like a retired person. So I've been a rebel, if you like, even a revolutionary all my life, and I'm even a revolutionary against age. Tell us more about soft vengeance. Armenians are feeling these days put upon, vulnerable, wounded, scared, and how to keep going. Okay, it, it's, okay. Not, it's not something I grew up with the idea of soft vengeance. 
In fact, I'm the only person in the world today, I think, who uses it, and occasionally people say, as L.B. Sachs says. Uh, and I think it was Gandhi, when he wrote about his life in South Africa, he called it my experiments with truth. He didn't start with a philosophy and apply it to his life. He drew out of his life and his experiences a number of ideas that ultimately came to be Gandhian. And sometimes he said afterwards, please save me from the Gandhians who are so dogmatic and insistent and, and formalistic. And he wanted ideas to come from experience. Uh, and, and so there's one bitter experience he had when after the Anglo-Boer War, when the British are now colonizing the whole of South Africa, uh, and there's a part of what's now called KwaZulu-Natal, where the Zulu-speaking people were rebelling against the taxes and against the oppression. Uh, and the colonial forces uh, fought them, killed many, and captured many and flogged them, hit them with whips. And Gandhi was in the medical auxiliary. Uh, and he couldn't bear to see these black men being beaten, 50 terrible blood coming out. And he would take uh, a sponge and he would wash the backs of the people who'd been whipped in that way. And he said afterwards, if I can see human beings suffering so much pain, then I shouldn't get pleasure from my body. And he took the decision to give up having sex. Now, he didn't consult his wife, uh, which is quite inappropriate. But he didn't start off by saying, I must be ascetic and I mustn't have sex so that I can have pure thoughts. It came out of the identification with the oppressed. So in my case, uh, if I can even go back to the beginning of this narrative, uh, I'm a new judge uh, on the court in South Africa, and I'm feeling fantastic because we have a wonderful constitution, which I helped to write, uh, and it brought promise uh, and hope. And not only was I one of those who helped to write the constitution, but now I'm on the court that's defending. And it wasn't just a constitution. Our lives are in that constitution. People, Ruth First was blown up by a bomb, a wonderful, wonderful, brave journalist. Uh, Luxmart Salwandli was tortured to death, beaten up. Uh, these are people I worked with. Jack Mabu was assassinated. Uh, uh, Lux, um, Babla Saluji was thrown out of a window in, in so the... All these people gave up their lives. They gave their chance. lives believing and fighting for something, and the Constitution is now incorporating their hopes and their dreams. When, when, when I had to swear to uphold the Constitution, now I'm very secular, but you can just say, I affirm, or if you want to raise your right arm, you say, say help me God. I said, so help me God, because I wanted this is the arm of sacrifice of the people who died. I couldn't give a more solemn uh, affirmation that, than that. The arm that you lost in the car bomb. Right, right. So now I'm on the court. Uh, and we've got some old judges, wonderful judges, under apartheid. They used what little space was available to soften the impact. And then advocates who weren't deep in the struggle, but who always believed in freedom and democracy. Uh, law professors, they're on the court with me. Uh, and I'm an, I've never been a judge. And I'm getting to know my way and learning. And many people are saying outside, he's not a real judge, he's a political appointment. So I want to prove that I'm a real judge. In which it's that phase, I haven't been very long. The telephone rings and uh, security says, there's a man called Henry who said he has an appointment to see you. I say, send him through. And Henry had phoned me to say that he was the person from the security military forces who had organized the bomb in my car that blew me up. He's now going to the Truth Commission to tell the story, uh, but he would like to see me before he goes to the Truth Commission. So Will the I person see him? who organized your assassination attempt he wanted planned to meet it. you. He planned it. it. 
and now he wants to meet me. And my heart's going boom, 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 you can imagine. And I'm walking along to the security door, and I open the door, and I see Henry. He's a little shorter than me, he's tall and thin, younger than me. And I see in his eyes, so this is the man I tried to kill, and he sees in my eyes, this is the man who tried to kill me. And we go to my office, we call my chambers, and he's striding like a soldier. And I try my best judge's walk to, to slow him down. And we sit down, we talk. We talk, we talk, we talk, we talk. And it's a strange conversation. He's so proud of the fact that he went to school, university, in the army, and he rose up through the ranks. And I must applaud him for becoming a senior assassin. It was kind of naive and weird. And eventually he describes the assassination attempt. It was postponed, he was taken off the case. He had a row with, apparently with one of his seniors. Uh, but when I was blown up, he knew that he was the one who'd been responsible for planning the whole thing. And I say, Henry, uh, I can't shake your hand when saying goodbye. Normally I shake hands when I say goodbye. But you go to the Truth Commission, you tell them what you know, and maybe we'll meet one day. And as we walk back to the security gate, he's going like a defeated soldier. And I forget about him. We worked very, very hard. Uh, being on that top court, that sense of the final word, the responsibility, you, very, very intense. And it's the end of the year, end of our year of summer. It's nice, warm like it's warm here. Uh, and a friend invites me to a party. And I go with her. And the band is playing very loud music. Uh, and I hear a voice, Albie. I look around, Albie. I can't believe it, it's Henry. And he has a huge smile on his face and he comes up to me and he said, and I went to the Truth Commission and I spoke to Bobby and Sue and Farouk. Three people who'd been in exile with me also could have been victims of the bomb. I told them everything and you said that maybe one day, and I said, Henry, I've only got your face to tell me what you're saying is the truth. I put out my hand. I shook his hand. I almost fainted. And he went away beaming. I heard afterwards, he suddenly left the party. He went home and he cried for two weeks. I don't know if it's true. I want to believe it's true. I'm not even checking. I want to be, maybe it's true, because that's more important to me than sending him to jail. And that's the one part of the the background. Uh, the soft vengeance came in between. Um, in Mozambique, in exile. Uh, I had been a law professor at the university, newly independent country, after 500 years of colonial oppression by the Portuguese, newly independent, fought for the independence, and they want people like me to come from all over the world to help them. They had four lawyers left. Some people make jokes about lawyers and say, you were lucky. Uh, and one was the Minister of Justice, one was the head of the bank, one was a law professor, other law professor. We had to build a legality for the new independent country. I loved that work, I loved that work. And it's April the 7th, Dia de Molière Mozambicana, the day of the Mozambican women, celebrating one of the women freedom fighters. It's a public holiday. And I'm going to the beach in the morning, meetings in the afternoon, and I've got my uh, bathing costume on and, and flip-flops, and I'm going down to my car at this uh, uh, red Honda, left-hand drive, and pow! Something terrible is happening. I don't know what it is. I just know when I used to be a mountain climber, I would bang my head and have that feeling, but it would go away. But it's not going away. And eventually I hear a voice in the darkness saying, Albi, this is Ivo Carrido speaking to you. You're in the Puta Central Hospital. Your arm is in lamentable condition. You must face the future with courage. And I said into the darkness what happened. And a woman's voice said it was a car bomb. 
I fainted, but I fainted into joy. I fainted into joy. I knew I was safe. I knew I hadn't been kidnapped and taken to be thrown into prison in South Africa. And that moment you're a freedom fighter, that moment you're waiting for, will they come for me? Will they come today? Will I be brave? You think about that all the time, not consciously, it's there all the time. And they'd come for me, and I was alive. Some time passes, I'm lying on my back, my eyes are covered, I'm feeling very light, very, very, very light. And I tell myself a joke. And it's a joke about Jaime Cohen, like me who's a Jew, he falls off a bus, he gets up, and he crosses himself. <laughs> makes that apparent sign. And somebody said, Jaime, I didn't know you were Catholic. He said, what do you mean Catholic? Spectacles, <laughs> testicles, wallet and watch. For some reason, I started with testicles. <laughs> and you were in one piece. <laughs> They always seem to be intact, uh, and, and people were so amused. So I've tried to be macho all my life. I've failed, except for that one moment, because the word went round the ANC camps. The first thing Comrade Albie did was reach for his balls. Uh, wallet, my heart's OK. Spectacles. My head's okay. I know if my brain is damaged, it's serious. And then watch, I've only lost an arm. Now, some people say that's the definition of an optimist. But that's exactly how I felt, and I feel that to this day. And I had a total, total conviction that as I got better, my country would get better. And two years later, I was flying back to South Africa. I'm flying back. I'm flying first class for the first time in my life. I'm unconscious. I can't even enjoy it. I end up in the London hospital uh, under an assumed name in case they sent, tried to get me with poison, which they were doing uh, to people in, in, in my situation. And I learned to sit up. The covering is taken away from my eyes. I can, I can see in one eye. It's fantastic. Uh, I learned to do things with my hands. I learned to eat. Uh, I, I learned to do my bowel movements, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm even saying, you know, that I sit, therefore I am, I shit, therefore I am. Yes. These are all little signs of rehumanizing myself, and eventually I stand, and I feel fantastic. It's like saying, Mom, 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 look, I can stand. I learned to write. With my left, you do dog, 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 fly, fly, fly. Look, mommy, I can write. It was like being born again. Uh, and I came out of hospital feeling overjoyed that I'd survived. But in between, at night sometimes, uh, I'd wake up 4 o'clock in the morning, the painkillers have worn off, and I'd feel very, a little bit lonely, a little bit sad, and I would sing. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. So here am I, the very secular person. I say, so help me God when I raise my arm. And when I'm alone in the hospital, I'm singing what we used to call a Negro spiritual. And then I fall asleep, and then I wake up in the morning again, and I'm much bright. And Nurses are giving me tea, uh, and one day I get a letter. The nurse says, a letter for you. You remember letters, those things with stamps you used to lick? You're of that age. And I open it with my one hand, and it says, Dear Comrade Albie, we will avenge you. And it's signed Bobby, one of those the people that Henry had met in the Truth Commission. And I think, avenge me. We want a country with people with their arms cut off, blind in one or both eyes. Is that what we're fighting for? If we get freedom, if we get democracy, that will be my soft vengeance. 
roses and lilies will grow out of my arm. A few weeks later, I'm in that same hospital bed. I'm walking now. I'm being taken in a wheelchair to move around, feeling much stronger. And somebody coming to visit me says, do you know, do you know, in Mozambique, they've caught one of the persons who put the bomb in Comrade Albi's car. And it goes through my head, if that man is put on trial, and if the evidence is not enough to show beyond reasonable doubt that he is guilty and he is acquitted, that will be my soft vengeance. Because then we're living under the rule of law. And that's more important than one rascal goes to jail. So that word soft vengeance came to, into my head from my unconscious twice. And when it came to writing the story about recovering, what it's like to wake up without an arm, and what goes through your head when all these things happen, and how you recover, and how you reconnect with the struggle that you're involved in. I called it the soft vengeance of a freedom fighter. I want to go back to before the car bombing. When you were living in Mozambique, living abroad outside of South Africa, but you still knew you were intensely vulnerable, physically vulnerable, they could come for you. I think a lot of people in Armenia and in many contexts can relate this sense of physical vulnerability because you're standing on the side of one story, a story that not everybody wants to hear anymore. So what's your advice to a society that feels that vulnerability and, and is trying to keep going? How did you keep going? What kept you going when you knew you were a target and in fact you were right, you were a target? In a way, you're describing being a bit liberated when you found out you could survive being a target. But before then, you were going around with that anxiety always running in your head. I was much stronger afterwards than I was before. I was scared after my friend Ruth First had been killed by a letter bomb. And, and I, I visited New York and I would stay with one of the top liberal lawyers there. Uh, and, and I said, Jack, uh, can you buy security? You can buy anything in, 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 in America. And I've got some savings and how can you help me? So he said, you know, I'm a liberal lawyer. I don't know about assassinations, but I can put you in touch with the police, the Human Rights Commission of Police. So uh, where? in New York, New York City. And I went to the precinct 39 or something like that. And it was like walking into, we used to watch Kojak. And there you see the American cops and the doors swinging and they're shouting at each other. Uh, and, and Sergeant Smart speaks to me. He happened to be African-American, and he just got it wrong. He assumed I was a white South African scared of being killed by blacks. And he never understood that I was a white South African on the side of the black people, scared of being killed by whites. And the only practical advice he gave me was take a different way to walk every day you go to work. Uh, and I said I had a door with uh, three doors, front doors and padlocks. Uh, he said, have you thought about a hole in your ceiling? I hadn't thought about a hole in my ceiling. So I was even more paranoid. And he said, be paranoid, that's good. So that's not great advice to give. But, but, but I, I kept going. It was, it was pride, it was integrity. I could have fled. Uh, but if I was fleeing now, in a way, I'm giving up my life before even being bombed. Surviving that somehow brought back all my optimism, all my courage. I can get through that. Uh, and I've, I felt joyous and, and triumphant. Uh, and it, it wasn't allowing them and their imposed fear to, to dominate me and dominate my mind. You are very engaged in the issue of dealing with the past. You have a lot to teach us from the experience of the Truth uh, and Reconciliation Committee in South Africa. Many societies that have been through genocide or war would wish to have such a commission. What did you learn about putting the pieces back together, how you reconcile it, and somehow live a better life because truth and reconciliation was even tried? And how complicated is it to achieve that? 
I think the strongest thing about soft vengeance is you feel strong inside yourself because you're in touch, you're in touch with your deepest aspirations, the things that make you human, the things that define you, the things that have given you the most uh, joy and also brought you the most pain in life. Uh, and there's a kind of togetherness and solidity. Uh, and that's the foundation of everything else. It's generosity. It's, it, it, it's not forgiveness. Forgiveness belongs to another realm. Forgiveness to say, I forgive you. I, I never forgave Henry. He didn't ask for forgiveness. I'm glad he didn't. But Henry felt overwhelmed. In the film that uh, was made, Soft Vengeance, My Life, he describes himself when he had to put out his hand to shake my hand and he discovers I haven't got a hand to shake. That gave him a terrible shock. He's never quite overcome that because I wasn't accusing him. I wasn't demanding. I wasn't vengeful to him. I was just living myself, being myself, being proud, being comfortable uh, and seeing the joy of we are now achieving the things we fought for. We're getting democracy, we're getting votes, the people are coming out of prison. That's all soft vengeance. We've got this beautiful constitution. We're hitting them with beauty. We're hitting them with moral courage and strength. Uh, and it makes it possible for those on the other side, we're saying the door is open, join us. We're not going to meet you halfway between crime and, 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 and justice. We're going to continue with our program of justice and then in that particular circumstances, we decided justice doesn't just mean sending people to jail, doesn't mean using the death penalty. Justice can take many, many forms. And one of them is opening the door for the people to come forward and tell the truth, which Henry did. He was one of only two soldiers. Uh, many of the police came forward. And the importance of telling the truth, uh, of acknowledging the truth, is huge. You know it, because there's denial of the Armenian genocide. And it keeps alive constantly. It's a constant reminder of the continuing insult and, 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 and fury uh, and wildness and gruesomeness of, of what happened. Uh, and, and it's so important to get the truth. And here we were getting perpetrators to come forward. And the Truth Commission enabled people who'd suffered so much, those who survived, to come forward and tell the truth. And it is what one American political scientist called converting knowledge into acknowledgement. Knowledge is we know these things happened. Acknowledgement means accepting emotionally what happened and how it happened. And for people to say, how could these things happen? And how can we stop it from happening again? And for those who suffered so much to say, yes, now the world understands what it was like, what we went through. And for those who did it, hopefully to lift a kind of burden to allow them to discover the humanity inside themselves. It went together, though it wasn't just on its own. It went together with the franchise, the vote. It went together with now having a black president it went together with a total change in the political life, uh, the culture of the country. Uh, it wasn't on its own. It was part and parcel of major social reconstructions. And to the extent that we are still a very unfair and very unequal society connected with race, many young people today are angry with the Truth Commission. And they say, we let them off too lightly. We should have punished them. But punishing them wouldn't have brought about equality. It wouldn't have brought about the changes that people want. Uh, so for me, my theme of, self, of soft vengeance has been validated by our constitution, by being on the court, by allowing my professional life and my energies now to be engaged with beauty, the beauty of freedom, the beauty of social solidarity, the beauty of acknowledging and recognizing human dignity as the centerpiece of, of the new order. And that is the, the core of what we're doing, uh, the core of, of, of our, the strength and vitality and, and openness, and it goes with truth. There's no dignity without truth. And truth alone is not enough, but it's central. Truth and dignity 
uh, together create soft vengeance. So what is your advice to Armenians who feel that their truth is not fully acknowledged? I'm still thinking about it. Uh, I'm still timid. You can't speak about other people's pain. You can't even understand their toothache. You know, people say, I feel your pain. Uh, it's not true. Uh, and, and so I feel very hesitant. But um, going to a remarkable museum, I mean, the monument is terrific. And it was a monument in Soviet times. It's very powerful, very beautiful. It was not the full truth because it was saying the people who died during World War, First World War, it, which was factually true, but it wasn't the whole truth. But people knew and understood and could, could go there in solemn moments themselves and, and, during the Soviet era. Uh, and, and make it into yeah. moving. And then the story. And the story is such a total refutation of denialism the telegrams, the photographs, the... Uh, so it, it's good to have that in one place, in one space. But I felt... Uh, and that's fundamental. You've got to have that. that that's the, the rock, the stone of what happened. But maybe something more could be added. Uh, and, and I told the story of visiting the African American Museum uh, in, in the Smithsonian, Washington, D.C. It's the best by far a museum I've ever been to, from every point of view. But it was so powerful because it wasn't just an accusation, denunciation. It was a story of survival, adaptation, resilience, through music, through stories, through struggle, uh, through affirmation, and it ends up with the great singers and scientists and writers and sportsmen and sportswomen so that people can, African-American, 80% of the visitors are African-American who don't go to other museums because they feel somehow their story is, they somehow feel marginalized, excluded. Even by science, you wouldn't think it's got anything to do. They just somehow feel they're not represented, they're not welcome there. Uh, here they feel very much at home, but also they can take their children. The children don't want to only see horrible things that were done. The transatlantic slave trade, people thrown overboard, uh, massacres of other kinds. And it's horrible for children to see that and to feel somehow my ancestors were treated in that terrible way. Uh, it, it, it's like pain is transmitted uh, and, and the hatred is transmitted uh, and, and the inhumanity is transmitted through the museum. Uh, so you have to confront the narrative of denial and denialism in an irrefutable way and not a, a piece of that museum should be changed. But there should be something else that accompanies it, not in a simplistic way, uh, but I have an affinity with, with Armenians. And I remember it started years back, and, and I was trying to remember the name of the writer, and somebody quoted from uh, Saroyan. So when I was a young activist, I, read the dairy young man on the flying trapeze. I like the, the story, but I like the energy. Yeah. I like the romanticism. I, I like the sense of joy. Uh, and and, and uh, I want to feel that uh, and, and connect with that and with the affirmation. And it's, it's, otherwise it's like a terrible football match and goals being scored by the denialists and the people trying to prove, and that battle is dominating the narrative, and you should, a way should be found of circumventing 
going behind, if you call it, the enemy of denialism. Uh, that, 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 that's more energetic and alive and affirmative. Uh, and, and maybe that would make it easier to, um, to connect up with progressive people. And there are lots of very brave progressive people in Turkey from all different backgrounds and so on. Uh, maybe people, uh, progressive Muslim people, there are, I believe, good relations with neighboring countries, and that, that's wonderful. But maybe people also with that sentiment and soul, and they know what it's like as Muslims to be persecuted and denied respect for humanity. Uh, I, I don't know, but it's something along those lines. When, when the, um, the, the director of the museum said, you know, people come from all over the world, and I see them from my office, and I see many women coming wearing uh, the veil. Uh, I'd like to see that picture somehow connected with the museum. I was told the story of, um, it's, I'm doing this third hand now. Uh, uh, Vanessa told me that she was told about a museum for children on the genocide in Amsterdam. And is it four children tell their story? And one, a child who is still surviving from that time, Another, a child whose father was in the resistance, was absent. Another, I forget what the th third child was, and the fourth, the child of a perpetrator. And it's done in a way that children can identify with. And they can feel the horror, but not a simple horror. It's, it, it's a horror uh, with affirmation, with survival, uh, with the beauty of words. Uh, and, and, and that sense that former enemies can, can, can somehow come together in, in, in a new generation. So I'm just throwing out certain emotional responses that that might be, might be useful. Before we turn to questions, do we have any? Let me check. Are there any questions yet in the floor? So I'll keep going until those, those uh, pop up. I'll in, continue to enjoy the privilege of asking the questions. Do you remember the affirmation, the line from that book? The daring young man with the flying, on the flying trapeze? Sorry? Do you remember the line from the Sarayan book? He flies through the air with the greatest of these. Uh, the daring young man with the, on the flying trapeze. Yes, yes, yes. Very I sort of dynamic. He yes. flies through the air with the yes, greatest yes. of these. Yes, yes. And, and for me, that's a sense of, of dangerous survival but survival, through ingenuity, through poise, through, through balance. Uh, and, and that's stayed with me. And, and um, uh, I wasn't a particularly good athlete, but I was daring. Uh, and in a way, my life has been very much like that. I've, I've never thought of, uh, but that was an intuitive connection with this very poetic um, uh, Armenian. You define yourself as a freedom fighter. What is the difference between fighting for freedom and fighting for human rights, if there is one? Uh, you know, th th again, that's something that emerged from, from experience. Because I don't believe you should uh, develop your space and understanding through pure logic and definitions. Uh, you should allow your experience to inform the definitions and pick up the contradictions and evolve and change over time. So, um, now what, where did that start? Freedom fighting versus... Yes, yes. So I'm invited uh, to attend a, a meeting outside on, on a wine farm. Uh, very wealthy people dedicating their money now for change, criticism, debate, discussion. Uh, and Albi, will you speak to, we've got 25 people from Palestine, the Palestinians, some uh, 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 Arab Israelis, uh, mostly from the West Bank, some from Gaza. Uh, and they're invited to come to South Africa. What can they learn from our struggle that will be useful for them? And so I'm in the room, and I don't ask who's from Hamas, who's from this, who's from... I don't want to know. Better I don't know. 
they're all Palestinians, they all have that common uh, appreciation of not being recognized for who you are, of being oppressed. Uh, and I'm introduced, and, and uh, former Justice Albie Sachs has been a human rights fighter all his life. And I say, no, I wasn't a human rights fighter. Human rights fighters are great. I'm a human rights fighter now. I'm a freedom fighter. Human rights fighters are lawyers and journalists and others who expose, who denounce. A freedom fighter is in the trenches. Uh, and it's a different place, uh, a different set of, of guidelines in your life. And I'm very proud that I was a freedom fighter. So it's the soft vengeance, not of a human rights activist even, the soft vengeance of a freedom fighter. It's part and parcel of it, because the answer then is not just human rights. Of course we want human rights, it's freedom. And without freedom, you can't even begin to get to human rights. If the whole society is based on a lie and oppression, then to say you want freedom of speech or you want a fair trial, you don't have the vote, you don't have land, you're humiliated in every way. So you've got to deal with these huge systemic things to even get to the human rights aspect. So that's when I said uh, 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 I was a freedom fighter. Now I actually can't believe my life. Now I've become much more respectable and more genteel and I'm not expecting to be blown up any day. Uh, and being a judge, I'm a bit aloof, remote from the political battles. And I'm glad I chose. I, uh, just before we had our first democratic elections, uh, I've got to start imagining I'm living in a democratic country uh, and feeling in some ways, we're being robbed of something. Being robbed of the vision of the future. You did so much because you had a vision of the future. And now we're going to be in that future. And we don't have that vision anymore. And the future is often bleak when your own people and comrades are doing terrible things. You deny that beautiful vision of one day we will be free. In the event, uh, we're getting close to the elections. And I noticed there are four members of the Constitutional Committee of the ANC on the National Executive of the ANC, Mandela's organization. Who's going to be the Minister of Justice? Will it be Kada Asma? Uh, will it be um, Dalla Omar? Uh, will it be um, Zola Skouye or will it be Albi Sachs? And I thought, no, I have to spend my life fighting to wonder, will the telephone ring, sitting next to the telephone, to hear, oh, Comrade Albi, it's uh, President Mandela here. Would you be interested in becoming Minister of Justice? And the phone doesn't ring, and I'm feeling, I felt, no, I've done my bit. I've helped to fight for freedom. We've got the Constitution. Now I can move on and do other things in my life. And I actually had the idea that I'd be interested in being on the Constitutional Court. That's the only legal thing. If I'm not, then I wanted to make movies. I can't even hold a camera, but I had some movies in my head. Uh, so it's one of the best decisions I've made in my life, as it turned out. To be a freedom fighter? No, to be a judge and not to, uh, I'm not anti-politics and anti-politicians. We need politics. We need political parties. They're very important. We can't allow ourselves to become cynical. If they, we're angry with politics and politicians, we must make it better. We must engage and make things better. But I stayed in that bubble with the Constitution. You don't make compromises when you're on the Constitutional Court. You balance, but in a very principled way. So I was saved some of the decisions that my comrades from the struggle had to make in politics. In politics, you do make compromises. You have to make compromises. You have to sometimes choose the lesser evil. In law, you don't choose the lesser evil. You determine balancing out all the constitutional principles involved in the facts of the case, the, the, the best answer that, that, that you can give. So that's one reason I can be buoyant and optimistic, because I've been protected, if you like, from 
being involved in all the tensions and the compromises and faced with the corruption, nobody's ever offered me anything uh, to, to, to sway my decision on, on, on the court. You started walking down the path of something very relevant in Armenia. Armenians around the world, certainly after 1915, dreamed of having an independent country. Uh, and the dreams are easier to enjoy than realities. So how do you reconcile with the fact that realities are imperfect, real countries are imperfect? And you've, you've obviously addressed that a bit, but it's, it's, it's difficult, it's emotionally difficult. There's a honeymoon period, there's a post-honeymoon period, there's, you know, you want to stay in love with the dream while working the reality. So, you know, what can you help us understand about that? Well, again, I'll, I'll come back to one of my, my sayings, uh, that the um, paradox of our lives, my generation, we were fighting with all our passion to create a boring society, where you don't put yourself on the line, risking torture and, and assassination and banishment uh, for the things you want. We've got a democratic system now. We can have the vote. We can speak our minds freely. Uh, and, and when I see we set up a commission of inquiry into state capture, and I see people I was in the struggle with, where they weren't the main looters, but they enabled the looters. Corruption. Of the corruption on a huge scale. More than corruption, looting. It's like robbery. Um, Part of me is deeply distressed. Part of me is joyful. The joyful part is it's being exposed. The truth is coming out. Uh, we have the investigative journalists. Our elections now are meaningful. Uh, so far, our party, if it loses, steps down. And I've got good, fairly good reasons to expect that that will be maintained. So I would say, in Armenia, you've had disappointments, but you don't uh, denounce the democratic system because it's allowed oligarchs and crooks and, and manipulators to get into office. You, you develop the democratic system. You take advantage of the opportunities you have. You pick up on the idealism and you'll find like-minded people. You'll be surprised sometimes by people whom you'd never expect. Uh, that idealism is very catchy. It's an infection of, of goodness, uh, and, and, and it, it adds something to your life. You feel connected. You don't feel cynical about life because you're engaged in a project that, that, that is, is searching for beauty and right and, and justice. I think that was the quote of my year. Uh, I can't wait to put it on Twitter. Before I go to my last questions, I want to give everyone else an opportunity is there a microphone for the front row? Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about the world order. Uh, st uh, states are polarized, leaders are polarized, individuals are polarized. What do you think about the present and are you hopeful about the future? You speak about so, in the world or in, the world, in South Africa? I mean, in individual countries, global system, it seems to be happening everywhere. Well, I've lived um, several decades, eight plus, uh, and the polarization when I was a child growing up involved uh, massive bombings, uh, concentration camps, gas chambers, huge invasions all over the world. Uh, today, it's ugly to see the invasion in Ukraine, but there's shock that three civilians died in shelling a house, and that's shocking in the world. In that sense, humanity has advanced. Another phase in my life, I'm a little bit older, and I was on the first anti-nuclear uh, uh, march in, in London. It was 1954, and we seemed to be mad. Uh, 
But the English tolerate mad, mad people. And we're marching down, I remember it's Oxford Street and the big buses coming by, and we have uh, a way with nuclear weapons. And within five, ten years, a million people were marching. Uh, and the idea of using nuclear weapons in those days, it was accepted. And there were tests all over the world, uh, contaminating the world. So that's been... When I was younger, the African continent we learned at school was painted red for the British colonies uh, and green for the French colonies and a little bit of gold for the Portuguese and a bit of purple for the Belgian. Uh, and now we have huge problems in our continent, but the countries are independent. We've gained independence. We've got great scientists and lawyers and artists coming. Uh, and I'll never forget uh, when I opened an exhibition in Vienna of the great Mozambican artist Marangatana uh, and, and um, he was speaking now to the elite of the elite of the elite uh, and he said thank you to the people of Vienna, of, of Austria, you supplying us with cement and water pipes, we're very, very grateful and what do we have in Africa we have a song, you give what you've got to give. Such a beautiful phrase, you give what you've got to give. To me a song actually is more profound than cement, uh, uh, cement and water pipes. But you give what you've got to give. And that's been accepted throughout the world in ways that were unimaginable before. So we do have polarization, but the way it's expressed is nothing like it has been in the past. And public opinion is important. And public opinion in the United States is important. And public opinion in Russia is battling to express itself, but it's there, it's there. So uh, in that sense, although we are polarized, we feel the polarization, not we feel the polarization. People in the West feel the polarization because you've got Trump and they are shocked because he's going against so many things that were accepted as normal. And he's made the ugliness of the past acceptable today. And you've got Hungary and you've got Poland. And they're shocked that so-called democratic Western countries, people who look like us, as they say, are, are polarized in that way. But the world as a, whole, as a whole is less polarized, much less polarized than it was decades ago when I was growing up. Uh, and I draw a distinction between globalization uh, and universalization. Globalization starts at a center and it spreads and takes over the whole world. Universalization is, starts everywhere in the world and you distill out of that certain common themes. And I've seen a huge increase in universalization. Basic themes of humanity now being accepted as foundational and they're not connected with race or with religion or with culture. They're connected with the dignity of being human beings. And for me that is the great source of hope, much stronger than the polarization. It's shocking because it's setting back things that were taken for granted. It's shocking that Russian troops can invade Ukraine. But that wasn't shocking when I grew up. That was normal. It happened all the time. Uh, you declared war and bombed, just, just straight away. So, um, if I'm called a romantic, I say thank you very much. If I'm called a dreamer, I say thank you very much. Uh, if I'm told I see the world through pink glasses, I'll say no. Uh, Where are they? My glasses are brown. <laughs> but in a sense, this optimism has been self-fulfilling for me in my life. Uh, if that bomb, a bit of shrapnel had gone just a centimeter this way, I would have been dead. So I was lucky in the sense that it didn't go that way. Uh, but being optimistic for me has been joyful. And I think it's good for my immune system. Uh, 
And I guess joy is part of self-vengeance? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's central. Um, maybe it's pushing it a bit far that people can feel joy. Uh, but it is joyous. It's liberating something strained inside yourself. Uh, it, it's letting go of, of, a, of a tension deep inside yourself that can be very destructive because you're so tight with your anger and your rage and the sense of being suppressed and defeated. And now it's saying the daring young man on the flying trapeze, you know, that, that, that is joy. What is more joyous, joyous than that? So in, in, in a concise how-to, how does one soft vengeance? How does one do it? The only time I've actually done it rather than... Uh, there was a time in Mozambique after about three years and I was feeling, generally, when I was in England, I had wonderful friends, I met marvelous people who did great things, but when I was happy, I was unhappy, basically. I felt in exile. In Mozambique, even when I was unhappy, I felt happy. I was basically in touch with newly independent, feeling the energies and so on. But things were becoming very awkward. They became especially awkward when I moved from having translators in the law classes to speaking Portuguese. And I just saw my esteem <coughs> crash. I was like a child, not like a professor. But people were saying, what's the matter with you South Africans? You formed the ANC in 1912 and you're still under repression. We formed Frelimo in 1962. Uh, and now it's 1975. You're so slow. Uh, and there were, I was feeling very alone. Uh, and then I decided, they had campaigns in Mozambique. This would be the year of, the year of um, developing our agriculture, the year of growing cotton. It's even the year of, of collecting cashew nuts. Uh, and I decided I'm going to have the year of happiness. It's crazy telling yourself to be happy. And starting on January the 1st, and something happens, and I tell myself, take it easy, I'll be. And you do that for a week. And I got into the habit of actually not allowing myself to be perturbed. Uh, it actually worked. So maybe on January the 1st next year, you can say, you start off, you're so upset by something, and you tell yourself, take it easy. This is my year of happiness. Only for a year, after two or three weeks, I actually felt much more comfortable inside myself. And happiness is self-fulfilling, because you're a nicer person to be with, and you do things in a gentler way. If it works, then we can patent it. Uh, and, and maybe we can have a, a trans-Africa-Asia uh, 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 partnership uh, in, in the happiness, the, the South African-Armenian happiness, <laughs> happiness I mean, exercise. I know, I know a good lawyer who could help us <laughs> count it. Uh, any more questions before I ask my final ones? Thank you very much. I had this kind of question. Recently I have started studying the history of Africa and I was flabbergasted by the atrocities committed in the continent by people like Siaka Stevens, I don't know, Idi Amin or the others. And recently the, the, general, the secretary of the US, Anthony Blinken, said that Africa represents the present and the future. So what do you think? Is there any hope that things will rectify and everything will get back to normal after so many years of suffering, slavery, colon colonialization, and things like that? Thank you very much. Uh, and I would add the Cold War. The Cold War was devastating for Africa because each side wanted strong military leaders who could be on their side, and, and it led to bitter civil war. But 
there's been so much more in Africa. We produce great writers, uh, great singers, great dancers, great models even. Uh, um, uh, and South Africa today, compared to where we were, for all our problems, it's way ahead. Um, so if Africa is the future, maybe it's because it's under-industrialized. Uh, it's under-crushed by aspects of modernism that has destroyed humanity. And, and what's been very powerful in South Africa is what we call Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu comes from an African phrase that I am a person because you are a person. My humanity is strengthened by acknowledging your humanity. It's not weakened. Uh, and that helped oppressed black people in South Africa, especially the poor, to survive the most terrible odds. And it's even become part of our jurisprudence as judges in opposing capital punishment and prohibiting it. My colleague, Ivan Mohoru, grew up very, very poor, uh, became a judge. Uh, and she said, if you have the spirit of Ubuntu, you can't have the state cold-bloodedly executing its people. We all belong to humanity. Uh, and, and that spirit is stronger in Africa today than anywhere else in the world. I think it's partly said because of the numbers, the growing numbers. It's still a relatively underdeveloped continent. Uh, and, and in that sense, it can represent the future. Idi Amin is now a symbol of negativity. He's not held up as a hero. Uh, Stevens is also a symbol in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, and, and these are the things that, that give me hope. Uh, I found, as a young white person growing up in South Africa from a very left-wing home, uh, anti-racist home, uh, I was received by black African people. Even when I would go to the office of a certain Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo, and I'm a second year law student, uh, and I wanted to show my respect for the first black law firm in South Africa on holiday in Johannesburg, I would go there. And Ruth Mompati, the manager, would give me a cup of tea, and either Mandela or Tambo would come and welcome me and say, Comrade Albi, how's the struggle going in Cape Town? Sorry we can't spend more time with you. You can see how busy we are. But it was an embrace. It was an embrace. Uh, I leap forward again in an experience. In England, I'm speaking about we're fighting for freedom. And people would say in that very English way, well, it all depends about how you define freedom. Now, if you have to define freedom, you're in trouble. I'd go to Ireland. And I'd speak about freedom and right on. You know, there was an emotion. There's a lot of that emotion in Africa that, that, that is, if you like, naive, but great belief in human possibilities. So I'm not despairing about our continent. When we got our first elections, people were astonished and amazed, 1994. It was a glorious year for Africa. It was the same year as the Rwanda genocide. The two faces of Africa happening at the same time, the drama. And yet, the people of Rwanda had extraordinary forms of reconciliation afterwards in the villages coming together. It wasn't done primarily through the legal system. It was done through enabling people now to meet uh, and to acknowledge what they'd done. There are problems in Rwanda now, very authoritarian rule, but uh, lots of progress has been made there. So I will give myself the last question of the night. You are clearly a wonderful storyteller. And you once said that judges are the storytellers of the 21st century. What did you mean by that? And why do stories matter? I, I think uh, over the ages, judges have always been storytellers. But they deny it. They say, we are simply servants of the law. But that's a story in itself. That's a role you put on. You accept it. Those are your lines, and you work in that way. I think now judges accept that the narrative is as important as the outcome. The reasoning, the principles you rely on, the values that, that you express. 
And there have been earlier periods where religious leaders have been the main storytellers of the whole nation. Others where generals have been the main storytellers. Uh, and now, increasingly, judges become the storytellers. And it's significant, if you look at our constitution, it doesn't start with power and institutions and structures. It starts with values. Uh, the beautiful preamble with foundational principles, non-racialism, non-sexism amongst them. Uh, it's got a Bill of Rights. It's got language rights. All of that comes first. And then comes the structures of the National Assembly and the voting and the president being chosen, which I believe is a big issue in this country today, uh, the judiciary, uh, and then different levels of government. Uh, and I think increasingly judges are accepting that they are not simply solution seekers to problems. They are also narrating something about the nation, about existence, about human beings. And without that, the outcome becomes unbelievable. The outcomes don't reach the general population. Maybe I'm saying this because people sometimes would say with very mixed voice, Albie was the poet uh, of the Constitutional Court. Uh, that's a compliment, but it's also a rebuke, as though poetry is not part of the law. And uh, if I have to be castigated for that, bring it on. Because for me, law is about human dignity, it's about people, it's about fundamental rights, it's about existence. And if that permeates the law, then it becomes respected by the people. And it's particularly important for the people who have the least dignity in their lives, who are the most vulnerable, who are most at risk. And so I used to believe and say, denounce law is just for the rich. And now I say law is for the poor. The rich don't need the law as much as the poor. The rich have got power. They've got influence. The rich can move. The poor can't. And so the law should be there for the poor. But we need more poets shaping the laws of our society. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing all your thoughts tonight. Please join me in thanking you. The most? the most significant achievements of constitutional justice in South Africa. I think the most important decision of our court in, in impact was uh, the treatment action campaign case, we call it, when the, ant when the HIV virus was decimating our people. And uh, to make it worse, there was denial on the part of our president. A brilliant, thoughtful, brave, sensitive person. And he goes on to the internet and he picks up a denialist professor in the United States saying the virus doesn't exist. That somehow it's the pharmaceutical companies and racist anti-African feeling is behind it. Uh, and he's resisting the distribution of ARVs, antiretrovirals. And the people on the ground living with HIV are angry, they're frightened, they're terrorized. It's spreading. Hundreds of thousands are dying every year, and it's getting worse incrementally. And it's threatening to destroy our democracy. But they organize. And they organize on the ground. And their membership is mainly people living with HIV, not human rights activists, people living with HIV. And they have brilliant leadership. 
And the leadership is out in the streets. The leadership is with journalists getting the story told. And the leadership is with lawyers. And they bring a case in the court. And they say our constitution provides that says everyone has the right of access to health care. The state shall take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to realize that right. And they say it's in our constitution, and this is being denied. And the state is saying, we are having two sites in each of the nine provinces on an experimental basis. It'll take us two years before we can take our decision. And we want to study breastfeeding transmission and problems administration. And people saying, we are dying, we are dying. That the drug nevirapine has been tested for safety. It's efficacious. It cuts down the transmission of the virus from mother to child by 50%. We are now women living with HIV. We want access to it. If we've got money, we can buy it. It must be safe, otherwise you wouldn't allow the chemists, the pharmacies to sell it. And we're being denied access. And um, the case comes to our court. And uh, I, I remember the court was filled with people wearing T-shirts saying HIV positive. We didn't throw them out of our court. We saw black, white, brown. Very small court then, temporary accommodation. It was like the nation. And they did silent. Uh, and the Chief Justice announces that uh, he goes through the facts uh, and he says, that the actions of the state are not reasonable, lives could be saved, and people won't be worse off if we provide the antiretrovirals while we're gaining uh, experience on how to administer it better. Uh, and the state, we declare the state is under an obligation to do it. So we didn't pick a fight with the president. Uh, we just declared it. We did it as gently as we could. And we had to deal with the argument which was said by the lawyer for the state. Judges don't prescribe drugs. The medical department, Department of Health prescribes judges, uh, drugs. If we are wrong, you throw us out of the next elections. And we said, no, our constitution includes social and economic rights. It imposes a duty on us to uphold the law, and now we have to develop the law creatively. The net result was the president accepted the decision, unhappily, but he was bound by it. And South Africa today has the biggest antiretroviral program in the world. And it's successful because people on the ground administer it. It's not just people in white coats. People on the ground were fighting for it. They tell their neighbors. You have to eat in a certain way, you have to cut out certain things, you have to keep up your bodily strength, and you have to take the, the retrovirals. So that case of, of social justice, health justice, saved millions of lives. But more than that, it gave, it gave credit to the Constitution. Uh, it, it gave significance, and to the poorest of the poor who were suffering the most. I would say if I had to single out one case, that that is the case. It also showed the importance of organization on the ground, civil society, the importance of journalism. It's not a case on its own, well prepared, on the ground, well argued, and, and you can gain a lot through constitutional justice. Any other questions from the floor? So, um, I always think of vengeance as an act. It's a premeditated act, and you have a plan to take revenge. But with soft vengeance, it seems to be more like a state of being. Um, and I guess people seek revenge or vengeance for closure. So, with soft vengeance, at what point 
would you reach closure, or is there a need for a closure, or is it just an ongoing process? So, you remember the story. I opened the letter. Don't worry, Comrade LB, we will avenge you. And I'm thinking, what will my vengeance be? My vengeance will be democracy. It will be freedom. It will be the rule of law. That will be my vengeance. Uh, and that's soft vengeance. It's not the vengeance where you do to them what they did to you. Then you like them, only you feel we are stronger than they are now. Soft vengeance is, is that generosity, that, that um, transcendence. It's very powerful. Uh, and it's a deliberately turning the word around of vengeance. Uh, it captures attention. But it, it was because I was responding to what Bobby was saying in the letter. I, didn't, I wasn't like a, a studio that is trying to promote a brand. What would be a nice phrase? That, that can promote my ideas. The, the phrase came first, intuitively, and now I become the promoter of the idea because it does seem startling, it does seem a contradiction. Uh, and it is a contradiction, but it's a, it's a creative contradiction. And does it give you closure? Does it? Give you closure? Not closure, I don't want closure. I want movement, I want forward movement. Closure is like it's over. It's not over, it's not past, it, it's, we're going beyond it, we're getting, we've, we've, we've you know, I'm, I'm using the image now of the man on the flying trapeze, he goes over, beyond, uh, rather than closure. Uh, the pain will always be there, uh, it's part and parcel, but the pain now is not seen as, as for nothing, uh, as, as totally futile, as totally ugly, it's out of the pain. We've, we've, we've grown stronger, we've gone further, not just through being nice, but through discovering the fullness of our own humanity. And if that enables the oppressors to start discovering their humanity, because they're not feeling they're fighting this boxing match all the time, that, that's an extra bonus. Vanessa Sachs, ladies and gentlemen. September. Oh, Vanessa Sachs. Pardon. I just want to half answer the question because I don't believe I'll be answered it fully. I don't think that the soft vengeance brings you closure. In fact, Italian, it gives you a feeling of a way of life. And if I can be as testament to living with Albi for the last 27 years, his sense of optimism and invincibility and just complete openness um, has given him a way of life that leaves him, that feeds this optimism and this ongoing, he's 87. Sometimes I look at him this evening now and I took out my camera to capture you because I'm thinking, oh my God, you're 87, look at you, you're nearly 90. And there's such vigor and, um, and passion in the way he lives life. And that's all part of the soft vengeance. It's not something that ever stops. It just opens you up to do more, to fulfill you in a way that you haven't been fulfilled before. Thank you. You, you, have, you have given us a path forward. That's big. Thank you, Albi Sachs. Thank you, Ms. Albi. You are always at home in your event. We're always waiting for you. Thank you. We have refreshments. Never, never without refreshments. Please help yourselves and enjoy the evening.